welcome to the high level panel on uh, operationalizing a red plus in the asia pacific region um, it's always challenging to manage the session in the late afternoon uh, but uh, hopefully um, quantity uh, doesn't sacrifice uh, quality of the discussion um, uh, colleague uh, as we know um, a cop decision have uh, given sufficient guidance to implement red plus from readiness to full implementation involving a uh, performance or result based payment including uh, what's our framework for red plus Paris agreement also recognized the important role of forest and encourage parties to implement and support existing framework as uh, set out in the guidance and decision for red plus including a uh, through result based payment many countries in the asia pacific region have already involved in the design and negotiation process of red plus under unfccc these red plus countries are also progressing on their works in preparing for red plus full implementation with result based payments nevertheless only few red plus countries have successfully accessed result based payment at the same time red plus countries are also facing challenges in coping with the global development affecting red plus including the existing red plus result based payment under various scheme outside UNFCCC mechanism also how will be the treatment of red plus post paris agreement this high level panel uh, brings panelists from various background of expertise and experiences current roles and institution to share on progress and challenges in red plus operationalization in the asia pacific region in terms of technical legal and institutional aspect including in accessing result based finance also to share perspective and idea on action to be taken to gain benefits from the global development outside UNFCCC and to uh, realize red plus contribution to the achievement of NDC target we have here with us eight panelists uh, first from red plus countries we could we have good representation from asia and from pacific uh, we have uh, miss emma rahmawati the director of mitigation um, in the ministry of environment forestry of indonesia and miss gwen siso a director of red plus and low carbon growth climate change and development office papua new guinea we have also representative from subnational government we have here professor dadi ruhiat the chair of climate change council in east kalimantan province indonesia we have also representative from international agencies supporting red plus mr huang chang senior forest and land use specialist green uh, climate fund and also uh, dr danai maniatis senior policy and technical advisor uh, climate and forest team undp bangkok from uh, private sector we have mr martin wilder head of global environment market uh, baker and mckinsey uh, from ngo we have uh, a very good combination from international mr jack hart conservation director the nature conservancy asia pacific and miss miss daniel andriani executive director of huma indonesia um a colleague a panelist and also a participant a con considering that we have only 90 uh, minutes for our session uh, so the, we will uh, give opportunity to uh, 
panelists uh, to respond to the uh, question that uh, we have sent earlier, and I will uh, also also explain the question uh, here. We'll start uh, from uh, Red Plus Country, uh, from uh, Bu Emma, then uh, Gwen. Um, colleague, ladies and gentlemen, uh, both Indonesia and uh, PNG have uh, played a uh, leadership role in the negotiation process. As you know, PNG was the uh, chair of the rain, uh, uh, forest, uh, the coalition of rainforest nation, and uh, Indonesia at the time also a leading ASEAN member states. Uh, both uh, we uh, successfully developed common position on uh, Red Plus. And um, with that, uh, we uh, also, both PNG and Indonesia, are progressing with our Red Plus. Um, at this opportunity, I would like to invite uh, uh, Ms. Emma and um, Gwen. Um, uh, both have the uh, same question. Uh, first, um, uh, could you share on progress and challenges in operationalizing Red Plus in your country, both Indonesia and PNG, in terms of technical, for example, a red, a, a frail establishment and MRV, a legal and institutional aspect, including progress and challenging in accessing result-based payment from different sources and mechanism, and ways to overcome the challenges. The second is, um, about the role of Red Plus in your country's NDCs. So, Bu Emma, five minutes. Um, thank you, uh, Dr. Noor. Uh, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. As UNFCCC decision uh, uh, have provided uh, parties uh, with uh, complete uh, guidance for implementation of Red Plus. Indonesia, since a couple years ago, uh, has uh, prepared uh, all instruments, policies, and also uh, institutional, institutional arrangement for Red Plus implementation. Uh, currently, Indonesia uh, has a national uh, strategy on Red Plus. Uh, we also uh, uh, have um, MRV and also National Forest Monitoring System. Uh, we also uh, has uh, established a, a, a safeguard uh, information system for Red Plus, and also uh, we have uh, submitted our uh, national uh, file to uh, UNFCCC. <coughs> In addition, uh, uh, there there are some uh, location that uh, uh, have uh, also. Uh, uh, could we use as uh, 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 <coughs> the DA, the uh, demonstration activities uh, of Red Plus that uh, give us a lesson learned uh, then uh, uh, give a substantial feedback to the policy. Uh, Ministry of Environment and Forestry uh, has, uh, uh, has established a, a ministerial regulation number 70, year 2017. Uh, this is a very comprehensive uh, uh, regulation uh, uh, for Red Plus implementation in Indonesia because this is covers not only technical aspect uh, which include uh, MRV and also uh, FRAIL but also uh, uh, include uh, uh, financial aspect and also institutional arrangement for implementation Red Plus. <coughs> uh, in addition, uh, uh, Currently, we are uh, in the process of establishing a financial institution uh, that uh, could, in the future, uh, manage uh, finance uh, for uh, manage funding for uh, financing uh, implementation of Red Plus. We call it as uh, Environmental Fund uh, Management Agency, or in Bahasa Indonesia, Badan Pengelolaan uh, Dana Lingkungan Hidup. Uh, as as this this institution has not yet. Uh, uh, established uh, uh, recently, uh, we we could not uh, really uh, uh, continue our process for for implementation the result-based payment for Red Plus. But uh, uh, based on our uh, current uh, uh, 
uh, preparation for Red Plus Indonesia is ready uh, for having a result-based payment uh, uh, stage for, for Red Plus. Uh, quite interestingly, as uh, previously mentioned in the previous uh, session, uh, the main challenges in this uh, issue is on MRV. How, how uh, we could uh, uh, provide MRV at national level and also at sub-national level and also on, on site level. Uh, it is uh, mostly related with capacity building and also the availability of uh, relevant and also appropriate uh, 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 institutional arrangement. Uh, in, in, in many uh, provinces in Indonesia, we do not have uh, such kind of institution at this moment. Uh, while we, we would like to develop that uh, under uh, uh, the implementation of Red Blast uh, at national uh, national level is under the ministry, but uh, at, at sub-national level, there should be a, a dedicated uh, institution uh, that are responsible for the implementation. And uh, with regard to the second question, uh, Dr. Noor, it is uh, Red Plus uh, talking about uh, uh, re reducing uh, deforestation and also forest degradation. It is very much related with our uh, uh, commitment on, on on the target uh, of NDC for uh, forestry sector uh, because uh, in our forestry sector uh, that consists of four big uh, activities one is a uh, reduction of uh, deforestation and then uh, forest uh, degradation and then uh, uh, restoration of peat and um, rehabilitation of forest and land so red plus is it included in these four uh, activities of NDC so it is uh, 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 therefore, uh, Red Plus uh, also could contribute uh, to the achievement of uh, NDC target. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Ibu Emma. Now I would like to uh, invite uh, uh, Gwen to uh, share uh, your progress and also challenges. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Noor. And uh, firstly, thank you to the government of Indonesia for the invitation and for the government of Australia for providing the support to enable me to come here. Uh, we are very much um, happy to be here to share this um, uh, progress that we've made so far. So why are we doing Red Plus? For PNG, our forests are very important, not only to our economy, which is very much based on extractive industries, but also most of the people, 85% or so, live off the land, um, livelihoods, and also the culture and heritage is based around the forests. So that's why we are prioritizing or we have prioritized Red Plus policy in the country. In terms of progress, um, we've made significant steps since Bali uh, with the support of many partners, including some who are organizing this uh, esteemed event, including the government of Australia, the governments of Japan, uh, and multilateral agencies and organizations. So with that support, we are very much um, um, humbled that people stepped forward to help us to see how best to plot Red Plus and the elements that the UNFCCC has asked us to do under the Warsaw Framework. So we have um, uh, developed a national Red Plus strategy. We have a forest reference level. Um, we have a national forest monitoring system. And we are now developing our safeguards information system. These uh, have been uh, developed through a collaborative effort with, uh, within the government and with all other stakeholders. Since uh, developing the National Red Plus strategy, we are now looking at a Red Plus finance and investment plan, which will help to identify where we could potentially uh, uh, bring in uh, support, both financial and technical support to implement the National Red Plus strategy. We also are progressing a Green Climate Fund proposal to, to do uh, similar, to, to implement uh, the National Red Plus strategy and to support the uh, FRL and FMS continued work. Our challenges are numerous and they are complex. For the red specific ones, which are technical, they're similar to Indonesia and 
also to the issues highlighted in the earlier panel, in that um, we need additional capacity for monitoring NMRV. We, um, at the moment, we don't know the sustainability of resources to continue the forest monitoring system that we have. Then we have issues of alignment within the national forest reference level, as well as project-based ac actions that are happening or uh, are proposed in some of the areas. So we need consistency in the methodologies uh, for us to be able to come in with a policy that says that subnational or project-based MRV will be similar to the national forest monitoring system. We need support with things like um, more um, detailed imagery, satellite imagery that are specific to the sites, uh, and that costs a lot of money, and it will need more capacity, manpower, to be able to do the assessment and the analysis. We also uh, need a system whereby we can start to allocate where the emissions are coming from, either sector-wide or through uh, uh, geographical sites. Uh, so we need something which is similar to a registry or a system of accounting for the carbon that we are monitoring and measuring. So while we've tried to work through our Red Plus um, elements and understand what they mean for us, we still have the existing challenges which uh, face the country in terms of our economic development, issues around social challenges, um, including land tenure, uh, governance. These, we believe, are very important if we will achieve Red Plus. If we do not deal with the existing business as usual challenges that we face in the country, Red Plus will not um, be successful. So therefore, we think that bringing in financial support for Red Plus will help us or will at least meet the transaction costs that we need to do to improve the challenges that we face to be able to implement Red Plus. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Gwen. I think the financial aspect, we will have uh, uh, three panelists at least that uh, uh, could address the issue later. Um, then next, I would like uh, uh, to invite Professor Dadi Ruhiat. Um, a colleague, uh, as uh, some of us knows that uh, East Kalimantan is the uh, champion of the uh, green uh, concept, the green uh, East Kalimantan. Also, uh, East Kalimantan is the province that uh, uh, receiving uh, FCPF carbon fund, I mean, has been approved um, to receive later, if we could show the performance, the FCPF carbon fund. So, uh, Professor uh, Dari, uh, please share with us uh, the uh, vision of East Kalimantan uh, green growth and the importance of uh, Red Plus uh, to support the vision. And second is also, uh, please uh, explain uh, potential contribution of FCPF uh, carbon fund to East Kalimantan uh, vision and how East Kalimantan aligns uh, its uh, endeavor to Red Plus national uh, policy and NDC. So, Pa Daddy, please. Well, thank you, Ibu Nur. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. There are two main reasons why East Kalimantan should implement green development. The first reason is because East Kalimantan province has experiencing less sound and less qualified economic uh, development phases. Since year 1970 until today, East Kalimantan development uh, uh, depends highly on uh, non-renewable natural resources. In fact, the economic growth rate of East Kalimantan 
was declining continuously from period to period. Another reason is uh, by extracting by extracting the natural resources, is Kalimantan province become the sixth largest carbon emitting prov province in Indonesia. Uh, major emit major uh, source of emitting stem from um, forest conversion and other land uses. Conversion of forest uh, driven mainly by palm oil, forestry, and mining, which creates uh, uh, deforestation, land degradation, fire, and draining of peatland. To overcome those challenges, in year 2009, is Kalimantan government has taken a significant step in form of uh, economic transformation. The economy of East Kalimantan uh, that originally uh, depend on uh, non-renewable natural resources was transferred into renewable natural resources in form of uh, agriculture in a broad sense, including the processing of its primary products. On the other hand, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, since year 2010, is Kalimantan government builds uh, readiness to uh, implement Red Plus. Uh, several programs has been taken, among others, uh, mainstreaming of uh, emission reduction program into provincial and district uh, middle-term regional development plan. Next step is the establishment of a provincial uh, council for climate change serve for uh, coordinating uh, activities in reduction of uh, greenhouse gas emission. Another step is uh, promoting a sustainable forest manage uh, promoting forest management unit and accelerating uh, social forestry program. Ladies and gentlemen, in uh, October 2015, uh, Indonesian Ministry of uh, Environment and Forestry has selected East Kalimantan Province as a pilot for performance-based uh, emission reduction jurisdiction program sponsored by uh, FCPF Carbon Fund Program managed by World Bank. In order to run this project, several strategy has been taken. First is to increase uh, implementing of Red Plus in the whole jurisdiction of East Kalimantan. And second is focusing uh, the project on uh, management practices that uh, can, redux, uh, can reduce emission reduction significantly. By successful implementation of uh, Red Plus, including uh, FCPF Carbon Fund Program, it is expected that the economic growth of East Kalimantan can uh, sustainably uh, develop, and also it is expected that uh, it can contribute significantly to the NDC uh, target. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, another thing that uh, is important in, uh, in FCPF Carbon Fund implementation is that the uh, all program designs to reduce emission should be integrated to the provincial uh, development plan and investment plan. I think uh, another thing is that the program must be aligned with the uh, national uh, red plus architecture thank you thank you pa uh, daddy to uh, for uh, sharing the green vision of east kalimantan and also the effort in aligning uh, with national uh, policy on that plus and uh, ndc um, now let's uh, uh, move to the other uh, panelists. 
We would like to invite a colleague from uh, international agency supporting Red Plus. We have uh, uh, Mr. Yuan uh, Chang and uh, Dr. Danai Maniatis. Uh, first, I would like to invite uh, Guan uh, to share uh, information on the status of GCF support uh, to forests, uh, particularly uh, Red Plus. Uh, this compared to overall uh, GCF uh, uh, support. I think this is uh, one thing that every one of us would like to hear. So, uh, Gu Guan, please. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Moore. Uh, can, we, can we put the presentation? Okay, thank you so much. So, this is a very brief presentation, and I, I want to show you some numbers. That's why I'm using the presentation and not just uh, as a speech. So, can we go to the next one, please? Uh, for some of you, uh, just to be uh, general information, better informed about the GCF. The fund is uh, operational since 2015. It reached effectiveness uh, once uh, a pledge of 10.5 billion was uh, reached. Now, so far, the fund provides several sources of funding. There is uh, funding for readiness support to countries. There is an allocation of 1 million per country per year. Uh, and under that readiness support, has been 80 million been approved in more than 100 countries. Uh, the way the fund operates is through accredited entities, and at the moment we have 59 entities that are accredited to the fund. So any proposal or any project that the fund will support will have to be uh, submitted to these accredited entities, and there are different kinds from uh, multilateral banks, NGOs, and others. And uh, recently, the last meeting at the board approved. Um, if I'm not mistaken, around uh, 12 projects, and in total we have approved 17, 76 projects uh, at, until February 2018. Next one, please. So the forest and land use sector is one of the priorities of the fund. Now the fund has two windows, one is on adaptation, one is on mitigation, and there are certain priority areas in, in each of these windows. So the forest and land use, is included in the mitigation uh, window of the fund. However, if we click again, please, again, we see that the forest and land use sector will also provide adaptation benefits. So in many cases, when we receive proposals in, in the forest and land use sector, these are covering not only mitigation benefits, but also adaptation benefits. And uh, one additional piece of information is that the GCF board approved an envelope of $500 million for resource-based payments since last year. And, and with that envelope, uh, GCF now is in a position to provide funding for all the phases of Red Plus, from the readiness, as I mentioned before, for implementation of uh, activities, and for resource-based payments. Next one, please. Next. Uh, overall, this is the distribution of how the funds have been uh, approved. As you can see in Asia, Pacific, uh, around one third of the total funds have been approved. And uh, there are different instruments that have been used in, in, the, in the approved projects. In most cases, the projects in the land use sector have been requesting for mostly grants. And I will, I will talk about uh, that a little bit later. Next point, please. And uh, if we are more specific on the forest and land use uh, sector, we have 10 projects approved up to now. And the total amount is $314 million approved. As I mentioned before, in most cases, these are uh, relying on grants. Next one, please. So here are the, the lessons learned and challenges that we see when we look at these projects. In, and it has been mentioned before, what we need to see is uh, the ambition to, to have uh, the overall Red Plus strategy being implemented. Now, this comes with a challenge. In many cases, what we see is um, a costing of how, how much does a Red Plus strategy can cost to implement, but what we need is a financial analysis. What is preventing the domestic and private sources of funding to implement that strategy? What can we do with the limited resources that we have from climate finance to unlock those barriers? And that's usually a, a missing element when we see proposals. Um, second element is the the sustainability of those investments. As I mentioned before, in many cases, the requests that we receive from the GCFR rely on grants, which is natural. Uh, of course, there are many needs that need to be addressed, and in many cases, 
the investments will not provide returns to, to use other financial instruments. Now, this comes with a question, how can these investments be sustained after the grants are finished? And, and this is where I think we need to innovate and trigger private sector uh, intervention in order to make sure that these investments will last longer. In, finally, it has been mentioned before by some of the previous panelists, uh, resource-based payments is fairly new for, for the GCF. It's actually the first time that the GCF is implementing a resource-based payment pilot program. And uh, this is subject to the process that the countries have to go through under the UNCCC. Now, uh, previously, the requirements that were set under UNCCC are not necessarily set for, for payments. Now, when we translate those results into payments, we see that some countries may face some challenges when they started uh, preparing their, their monitoring systems and reference levels, and in the absence of, of data, they may face challenges in translating this into possible requests for payments from the GCF. Now, I have many more points, and I'll be happy to discuss if there are questions. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Juan. The next, uh, I would like to uh, invite uh, Ms. Danai. Um, we would uh, like to uh, hear um, your uh, experience and lessons in uh, facilitating uh, Red Plus countries at the various level, from uh, global, regional, and also uh, national level. Um, from the, the start uh, of uh, readiness phase to uh, full implementation. And um, once again, I always uh, uh, focusing on the challenge in assessing, accessing result-based finance uh, from various sources and also uh, mechanism, including uh, GCF. So please, uh, Ms. Danai. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ibunur, and thanks to uh, the hosts for inviting me uh, today to, to participate in this very interesting event so far. Um, so I was asked to share experiences and lessons um, in supporting countries in implementing from Red Plus through readiness to implementation to results-based payments in five minutes. Um, so that's a tall order. The first, so I have a few points I would like to, to share with you here today. Um, also in the opening speeches this morning, what we've been hearing uh, in related to Red Plus is deforestation and forest degradation. Very important. But there are another three activities in there. And if we want to talk about this issue, we need to talk about all five of them. Um, and that's a discussion that's often lacking. We tend to focus on deforestation and forest degradation for obvious reasons, but the other three activities being conservation, sustainable management of forests, and enhancement of forest carbon stocks are equally important in tackling this problem. Um, the Red Plus activities are obviously enshrined in the UNFCCC COP decisions and in the Warsaw Framework, and that is our guiding book when we look at supporting countries for Red Plus implementation. But it's not a simple book, and I would like to make an analogy here today on building a house. Building a house is not simple, right? You start with an architect, for example, and you draw up a plan. And what you need are really strong foundations and pillars. And you would hope that your house withstands uh, the days of time and you end up with a Greek temple that is still standing many years later. Red Plus and the Warsaw Framework are function in the same way. What we have with the Warsaw elements are really the foundations and the pillars for Red Plus implementation. They need to be really strong and they take time. And that is the readiness phase that we support countries in building. But if you have a house that has a strong foundation and pillars and a roof, but has nothing else, would you live in it? Would you use it? Or how much would you use it? Not very much, right? You want it to be functional. So the challenges that we face and the discussions that we have with countries is how do you take these elements and operationalize them? How do you make them functional? 
How do you make Red Plus functional in the, in the NDC context, in the SDGs, and how do you make it important for the countries across the government levels? So, you've built your house, you've had a great architect, but you need a plumber, you need an electrician, and this is really important in Red Plus as well. The ministries of forest and environment are the heart and soul of this discussion. But if we're dealing with situations where the driver, one of the main driver of deforestation could be agricultural commodities, if we want to find a solution, we need to be talking also with the Ministry of Agriculture, we need to be talking with private sector. So in some of our work, for example, in, in Papua New Guinea, we've been working with uh, the Treasury, the Ministries of Mining, the Prime Minister's Cabinet, to make this a reality. While we're looking at the plumbing of our house, a key point, and Juan just touched upon it, is investment planning. We can have really robust foundations and a great national strategy, Red Plus national strategy or action plan, but how do we turn that into a reality? And investment plans, plans are for us are a key part of that puzzle. How do you take this strategy? How do you operationalize it? How do you make sure, try and make sure that all of the great initiatives that are ongoing are not all overlapping? And how do you help the country navigate that difficult landscape and bring in the finance that you need and create those conditions? So looking at the financing opportunities, the investment opportunities, you can also look at the land use the landscape of land use finance in the public sector and in the private sector, and that's what we've been helping countries think through as well. So, Juan mentioned before, a lot of the instruments seem to be grant-based. Two other important parts of this uh, puzzle are looking at the land use, the public land use finance, and the land use in the private sector, and trying to pull all of those strings together. Now, all of this cannot be done without strong stakeholder engagement. That can be within and across the government, but it also requires all the other stakeholders in the countries. And for example, in Vietnam, we've been working with ethnic minorities that are part of this process, and it's the first time they actually have a voice in, in this debate and are seen as an equal partner by government. Now, we have our house, and I'm down to zero minutes. Um, how do we access results-based payments? How do you maintain it? We've made it functional, right? Um, and how do we support countries in getting to that part where they can say, okay, we're ready to access results-based payments? It's not one solution. We've seen uh, today, we've heard from different people what that can look like. And this is the really creative and fun part without reinventing the wheel. It becomes very difficult often for countries to look at all of the different requirements be it from the Forest Carbon Partnership Facility Carbon Fund, be it from the Green Climate Fund, be it from bilateral agreements, or from trying to attract private sector. Um, so what we try to do as a, as a trusted partner in our convening role is trying to bring all of those stakeholders together and understand together how we can make results-based payments a reality for countries without making it incredibly complex. To finalize, I'd also like to leave you with a question, with an ask uh, in this discussion. Where we're talking about policy design and policy implementation, creating enabling environments for, to attract investment and business, we're talking about changes. And what we often lack, I think, is understanding how people, everyday people in the developed world and developing countries make these decisions that impact on Red Plus and the land-based sector. Um, and we need to embrace the interdisciplinarity of Red Plus, I think, in a much broader way in this sense. We need to work with uh, sustainability psychologists, with behavior psychologists when we're talking about implementing policy design, changing markets, bringing investments in to make sure that everyday people and everyday decisions um, have these solutions in front of them and so that we change the discourse also from what it seems to be an unovercomable task and all challenges and focus on the solutions. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Danai. Now we come uh, to uh, the a few uh, from private uh, uh, sector. 
um, Mr. Uh, Martin Welder. Um, existing Red Plus related result based payment involving a private sector are mostly uh, project based uh, activities. Uh, Red Plus by concept under UNFCCC negotiation and what we have agreed already is national approach. Uh, forest countries generally included uh, forest or Red Plus in their NDCs. This is national commitment under the Paris Agreement. So we would like uh, you to share your perspective and ideas on how Red Plus could benefit Red Plus countries and assisting them to contribute to the global goal under the Paris Agreement uh, through uh, their NDCs. The second is uh, your views on the possible option uh, for engaging uh, private sector in uh, achieving the Paris Agreement goal and sustainable development goal. So uh, please, Mr. Martin. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so as you've just heard, I've been asked to firstly comment on how RED can benefit countries in meeting their NDC goals. Um, I think first of all, we just need to re remind ourselves that, that really the NDCs are a, 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 a country's plan as to how they're going to meet and contribute to the global 1.5 degree goal. And in many cases, as you know, the NDCs lay out a plan within specific sectors as to how this will be achieved. And if you take the renewable energy sector or the transport sector, it's very much about driving public and private capital into those sectors to help a transformative change. And in the renewable sector, it's very easy. You talk about moving a country to 50% renewables and you look at what Morocco did in terms of undertaking a major reform path, a major investment path. It's something that you can, you can see. In the land sector, it's far more complex because the issues are, are much more difficult. Now, while many of the NDCs do include land use in red, there are a number of countries that as yet have not included those sectors. Um, and in many ways, when you're talking about um, any protection of forests under an NDC, the important point to remember is that it doesn't just benefit the country itself, as we've heard all morning today, it benefits everybody in the world because of the benefits globally of forests. And that's an important point when we hear Juan talk about the results-based payments because results are about getting outcomes and results as opposed to just getting carbon. <coughs> so in terms of how do you incorporate RED into an NDC, uh, there are a range of ways that, that this can be done and it's very important that the distinctions are recognised. One is that it could be a key mitigation tool tied to an overall emissions reduction target or it could be a key mitigation tool f for the benefit of, of just simply delivering results. It could be a key adaptation tool. If you take Kenya's NDC, it's simply a commitment to maintain a certain level of forest cover uh, consistent with the constitution, which is 10%, and that's now been amended to 15%. So that's a promise to, to, to deliver on an outcome as opposed to accounting for abatement. And so as we look at those NDCs, they all treat carbon differently. Um, and so there are a number of issues that really are arising at the moment as to how you treat forests and red within NDCs. The first is, as countries go about aligning their NDCs with, with, with red, you need to make sure that you align that commitment with existing obligations. So a number of countries have existing obligations under the German Red Early Movers Program, under the FCPF, commitments with Norway, and countries need to consider how these existing commitments align with any NDC commitment. So for example, there are some countries that have committed to, to sell the large part of their carbon stock within their forest to the FCPF, w w of which there is no problem with, but at the same time they have an NDC that talks about maintaining a certain carbon stock in country. So that brings us to the issue of really then double counting and the, and the, and the relationship with Article 6. Article 6 is still developing. You heard the Australian Minister this morning talk about the desire to go to other countries to purchase their carbon and, and to take it as an offset mechanism to Australia. And so if, if a country were to do a red transfer under Article 6, um, we don't know how that will be entirely accounted for, but we're assuming that there will be a similar debit and credit mechanism as to what you've seen in, in, in the Kyoto Protocol. So in many ways, this distinction between emission reductions for sale and payments for results is a very important distinction that has to be considered. And then finally, there's also the uncertainty for existing investments and voluntary transfers. 
So a lot of money has been invested in early stage projects in red, but a number of governments are now saying that those transfers will no longer be permitted post 2019, 2020. And the clearest example of that is Peru who have issued a policy to say that, the, that um, those transfers will not be, for the time being, will not be permitted. So this brings us then to the private sector and, and how do we engage. And I think I sort of sit, sit both in a private sector role but I also am, am the chair of a large NGO and I'm also on the board of a government body. And when I look across the spectrum in which I work, there is a clear, um, there's, there's a clear lack of discussion between the private sector and the public sector as to about, as about how, how to make this work. So the first thing about engaging the private sector is that we need to understand what drives the private sector and, and, and what is a driver of investment. And that investment will only come if they can make money as an economic return, if they're paid to do it, or thirdly, there's some regulatory environment which requires them to, to make investment in forests. And that requirement is very much, might be an emissions trading scheme or an offset program. Secondly, you need to understand the conditions that drive private sector investment, um, and that is a, uh, a good, that's legal and governance certainty, that's legal title to assets, and actually something to invest in. You actually need to be able to invest in something that provides a return, and finally, low sovereign risk. Um, you also need to understand that the private sector I invests in, in either assets or projects or financial instruments or programs, and they always look for a good financial manager. So trying to talk about investing in a large-scale country-based red program is a difficult leap for the private sector, particularly w w where there are a range of risks. And that's why to date, the project sector, sorry, the private sector has very much focused on project investments because they're investments at a particular scale which they can understand and get their, their, really their assessment around. So going forward, what do we really need if we're going to get private sector capital to flow? The first is that we have to value forest uh, conservation and preservation. We talked a lot about this in the last session. But unless you've actually got a value placed on, on, on preserving forests beyond a philanthropic value, you simply will not get large sums of capital to flow. And that means you need a carbon market, you need somebody paying you to do this, or you need PPPs where governments work with the private sector to make that happen. Um, you also need to recognise that, that there is uncertainty and challenges with, with a jurisdictional approach, which I'll come back to in a moment. You also have to grandfather and not damage existing projects. So where you have the private sector who have invested hundreds of millions of dollars in early stage projects, governments need to pick those projects up and sweep them into a jurisdictional approach. If, you, if those projects are killed at this stage, they will, it, will, it will significantly be to the detriment of any future investment because people will consider that the sovereign risk is too great. You also need to see the current investments in individual offset um, forests which are projects in a, in a way as part of the solution and not have an ideological op opposition to them, which often is the case at the moment. After all, if you're trying to build a jurisdictional approach to forests, you need investment in individual pieces of land and forests, which are all part of the, 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 the patchwork of forests that will go towards protecting the entire forest in a jurisdiction. Um, you also need, and this was mentioned before, to focus on um, how you build a, a, a greater sustainable forestry sector and how you encourage investment in forestry that will rebuild degraded lands but also help supply um, uh, timber material for, for building homes. You also need, second last, to take an economics lesson. So one of the challenges here is that a medium-sized red project of the size you've seen in the VCS costs about two to six million dollars a year just to break even just to run and to keep going. If a government runs a national park, it requires a huge amounts of resources. So if you want to save all of the forests um, in a country, you need, you need billions and billions of dollars to do that. And this is the challenge we have before us. And then finally, the final comment I have is that you need to make, the, the approach to jurisdictional red at the moment, which, which is a very positive approach in terms of addressing this at a national level, is a policy design approach. It is not an investment plan. And what we need to do is we need to take jurisdictional red in very much the, the way that Dan said and turn it into an investable model. So the private sector at the moment will not invest in a model where if it invests and it turns out that the forest reference level drops, its investment um, can, can be removed. So you need to have some sort of system by which the jurisdictional approach 
actually encourages investment. It deals with sovereign risk. It deals with the risk of reversal. So that if you're an investment investor or if you're uh, if you're actually providing the money to invest in projects that you know there'll be some ability to one, get an economic return and two, protect you from any loss. So going forward, there are, there are quite a lot of challenges. We're not quite there yet, um, but there is no doubt that there is a significant amount of private sector money that wants to go behind the public sector money to invest in red. Thank you, uh, Mr. Martin. Um, we have uh, two more uh, uh, panelists that um, are going to uh, to share with us. Uh, first, I would like to uh, invite uh, Mr. Jack Hart. Um, the team uh, protecting uh, forests and people, supporting economic growth, uh, was selected for the Asia Pacific Rainforest Summit. Uh, the, the third, uh, with a strong uh, message that in order to protect the remaining forests and people, especially whose livelihood depending on forests and forest resources, economic growth narrative must be part of the forest policies. So we would like uh, Mr. Jack Hart to share with us uh, your experience and lesson in mobilizing a public and private finance for forest and sustainable land use. And then, uh, your perspective and ideas on future treatment of Red Plus under the Paris Agreement and future role of NGOs in enhancing role of forests in climate change regime and sustainable development goals. So, uh, please, Mr. Jackard. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Ibu Noor, and thanks for the uh, invitation to be here from the organizers. Happy to do so. Uh, so a couple things, uh, just a, a little bit of background. So when the Nature Conservancy, and we're a conservation organization, when we think about forests, we think about them in a pretty holistic fashion. We look at the economic values, the social values, the environmental values, and the climate values. Uh, the Nature Conservancy first did its, its first forest carbon project in 1997, and so we have a fair amount of experience over the last 20 years in these sorts of activities. But, you know, if we, if we step back and look at the broader use of forests and the relationship between these different types of values, we recognize that the relationship is increasingly being embraced and, uh, and understood by a lot of different sectors, by the public sector, by the private sector, by the finance sector, by community groups, et cetera. Um, and by conserve, but the problem is with conserving and sustainably managing and restoring forests, this remains a significant challenge for us all in many countries because that idea runs counter to the prevailing economic model. And the prevailing economic development model in many forested countries involves expansion of lands for agriculture, for ranching, for mining, and associated infrastructure development. And it's those activities that drive the deforestation and the forest degradation and CO2 emissions. So I, I think what we need to be thinking about here with forests is how do we make forests part of a new economic development strategy rather than uh, forests suffering from the results of current economic development strategy. And so when, when, when I think about Red Plus, and I think about the role of forests within NDCs, I think about the role of forests as part of rural economic development, rather than something that's sort of set aside to be handled by the foresters only. Now, as an organization, we started thinking about a jurisdictional scale approach to Red uh, Plus in, after COP13 in 2007 in Bali. And I think from a jurisdictional scale, we think about a number of different things. One, it can't just be about changing emission reductions at a site. So changing the way that land use happens in a high 100,000 hectares and measuring the emission reductions from that. It's really important that we do that at the site level, whether it's uh, around the way the natural forest is managed or whether the expansion of oil palm or plantation timber or rubber or agriculture products proceeds. But we also need a few other things around that site-based activity. We need good, solid land use planning in which multiple parties are involved, including affected communities. 
We need a supportive policy environment that incentivizes good planning and practice and penalizes bad planning and practice. We need strong MRV systems to track performance in a way that is consistent with UNFCCC protocols and procedures, and we need to do that at a scale that lowers transaction costs. And we need results-based financing as a way to re reward performance. What we have found over the years is that it's, it's difficult to fund this sort of integrated approach. Uh, you know, the funding for industrial scale forest management has largely decreased over the years. There's some notable exceptions to that. Uh, the Australian government and the Norwegian government being two exceptions to that. Uh, but it's been hard to attract money uh, in the NGO sector and with other partners for forest management. Funding is often available for public-private partnerships with industry that focus on driving sustainability into agricultural practices. Uh, but given the complexities of supply chains and the land tenure status of producers, it's really hard to translate those commitments uh, with companies into results at a scale that matters. Always challenges trying to attract resources for land use planning um, because the, the region is littered with land use plans that don't actually affect decision making on the ground. Um, and finally, there are policy commitments. There's been a lot of great effort over the last 10 years, let's say, on moving towards timber legality assurance systems. But at the same time, it takes a long time for those to play out. So I think the summary point there from us is that if we look at a jurisdictional scale approach uh, to Red Plus, it's very difficult to attract the different bits and pieces of money required to execute on that. Um, thankfully, there's a lot of good thinking happening now around blended finance in which we take <coughs> development finance, private sector finance, philanthropic investments from donors and try to pool those resources in a way that each can pick off the bits and pieces of a jurisdictional scale approach that they're quite interested in and which they can value the risk and value the return from. Now, when it comes to the, the role of NGOs, and I'll just wrap this up with two quick examples, uh, one of the things that we find, if we look around a country like Indonesia where there's approximately 20 million hectares of industrial scale forest management, there's about half of that that's economically viable. Securing the economic viability of the half, of the, the 10 million hectares, let's say, is perhaps one of the most cost-effective and long-term efficient ways to keep forests standing and therefore to continue to preserve their ability to sequester carbon and serve as a carbon sink going forward. So it's a really good strategy in this country to figure out how do you make long-term the economic viability of the forest uh, the, the long-term viability of the forest uh, in, a, in, a, in a way that can produce goods and services for market. In other countries in the region, Myanmar, for example, desperately trying to figure out how to restore two million hectares of forest for watershed values, for fuel wood sources, uh, as a way to regenerate re its, uh, its teak industry. In both of these instances, there's a role for NGOs to try to bring different parties together to try to promote multi-stakeholder processes, to try to promote multi-objective planning, and to try to stitch together the experience, the skills, the financial resources, and technical expertise of different types of organizations. So maybe I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Hart. Uh, now uh, I would like to uh, invite uh, Ibu uh, Dahniar Andriani um uh, from um huma um masyarakat hukum adat internationally known as indigenous people uh, have uh, local wisdom and long history of uh, best uh, practices in managing uh, forest and this value in uh, indonesia is already um, taken into account when we develop principal criteria and indicators for uh, safeguard information system for Red Plus. And uh, the historical um, moment when uh, President Joko Widodo uh, granted legal uh, recognition to Hutan uh, Adat. Um, Ibu Dahniar has uh, played very important role in facilitating uh, masyarakat hukum adat. So we would like to uh, listen from Ibu Dahniar 
uh, about your uh, experience in uh, facilitating capacity development and institutional uh, strengthening of masyarakat hukum adat and also uh, your perspective um, how to enhance the engagement of masyarakat hukum adat um, not only in Red Plus but uh, also in NDC implementation. So Bu Dahniar, the floor is yours. Thank you Bu Nur. Uh, Okay, uh, Huma, uh, with the Hutan Adat Coalition, we have uh, more than hang on, uh, four or five years to advocate for uh, indigenous peoples in some uh, in 11 provinces in Indonesia, uh, such as Aceh, Jambi, uh, Bengkulu, Banten, and etc. To getting the recognition, and at least for the first time after the Indonesian independence in 2016, the president gave the, uh, the 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 formal recognition in the palace. So this is a not uh, it, it, it is it is not a, a short way. It is a long journey uh, for us because <clears throat> if you ask how about to strengthening the the institution. I so for uh, I can give you four aspects to see that the first aspect is uh, communities itself because they need to assist it. So we need more uh, people or more uh, NGOs to facilitating them to to organize uh, the community to to find the way. What are they doing for their uh, areas? Because if you know Indonesia, we have a lot of uh, laws who who destruct their uh, their traditional laws such as uh, laws number 5 1979 about uh, rural uh, about village or this undang undang desa so uh, it takes a, a long a long way the second the second aspect is uh, more important first about community and uh, look, uh, and ngos uh, to work together uh, and the second aspect is, uh, I think, is more important is uh, local governments. We can see the sample in uh, Kajang people in Bulukumba District, South Sulawesi, how the local government with the local NGO work together uh, to facilitating the Kajang people to achieve the recognition, not only from the uh, president but uh, at local. Uh, uh, regulation. Uh, this is uh, another story about uh, local uh, recognition. And the third one is more important thing how to get the, the strengthening is uh, the law, the law, uh, the, the, uh, the, law, the law opportunities because today is Indonesia <coughs> since the court decree Decision number 35, 2012, it is uh, recognized the, in, uh, the other forest is not the state forest anymore, but the community forest. It is the, the high jump from the state uh, authority giving back to community. And, uh, for, uh, then, and the fourth aspect, I think, is uh, better when the Joko Widodo or the governments today have their uh, development framework or Nawachita, which is they mentioned two aspects we, uh, will give a, a huge opportunity to us. The first aspect uh, talk about uh, the, how to say, if you start to development from the rural areas, it means because a lot of Indonesian people in Indonesia living in rural areas. And the secondly, we talk about the uh, the keberagaman uh, in uh, or bineka tunggal ika. So it is uh, the two aspect which is uh, as a, a values uh, of uh, nawacita. So the four aspect is help us to 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 push uh, the government to recognize, but. Uh, in the uh, in other hands, we facing a lot of uh, barrier. If I <coughs> if I saw my note, 
first, if you talk about indigenous people's uh, authority, it's not in uh, environmental or and forestry ministry. If you talk about indigenous people <coughs> issue, you have to face a lot of ministry in Indonesia, such as social ministry, uh, agrarian ministry, and <coughs> uh, village ministry too. So the, the sectoral issue, it makes a uh, complicated to, 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 to set up the rights of indigenous peoples. And secondly, it's about the recognition in these people as a legal subject. Because in Indonesia, you cannot say yourself as uh, in these peoples if you don't have any recognition alone from the government, especially the local government, or we most popular say perda or surat keputusan kepala daerah. And it is takes time because it uh, need more money, more uh, political situ uh, political uh, attention, because if you looking, if you issuing the perda, you, you must need uh, facing not only the local government, but you have to facing the, the local uh, legislative assembly, so or DPR, DPR days. And the third one is, okay, after the recognize the subject, it, it doesn't mean recognize the object of indigenous peoples. So there's two difficult stages to be indigenous peoples in Indonesia for recognizing their self or their rights or natural issues. Uh, you can see in Hutan Adat, you can apply Hutan Adat if you can become, improve yourself as indigenous people. So as indigenous people, you have to show your uh, 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 a local regulation that stated that you are indigenous peoples. And uh, the last one is, In many areas, is uh, conflict areas is not conflict is about claim not only facing the the, the company but also the government claim such as national uh, park. So this is uh, the, the the situation with uh, facing the Indonesian people in Indonesia. So if you ask how they can be participate uh, or encouraged in a Red Plus uh, engagement in, in Red Plus or NDC implementing. The first thing is you, you should uh, solve their problems about the land issue. The secondly, you have to recognize them, which is, is not easy in these countries. So I think even though the government have the, 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 the good framework about uh, climate change or Red Plus or any, any name, but the basic uh, problem should be solved before. Like recognize the news people, and the object of news people and the conflict on that area. I think that's it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Bu uh, Dahniar. Um, colleague, we uh, have about uh, 16 minutes uh, to uh, five. So we can uh, take up uh, about three questions uh, from uh, the floor and let's see. Uh, how ma uh, how fast we we move? So please, uh, any uh, question? No question. Yeah. Uh, okay. If uh, no question, I will start uh, uh, first the question to the panelists. Uh, uh, first to uh, Guan. Um, uh, from your presentation, if we look at because we are now. Uh, in the Asia Pacific uh, event, if we look at the, the what is the fund allocated or fund committed uh, approved for Asia Pacific about 34.7 uh, percent, uh, but when we look at the land use uh, change and forestry, we are in the forest summit. It's only very uh, few. Uh, countries who uh, could already access the fund. So, uh, sitting in the green climate uh, fund, uh, could you uh, share what is the the possible uh, causes why it's only uh, very few uh, the uh, project uh, proposal approved? Uh, in land use uh, sector from Asia Pacific. 
So please. Thank you very much. Very good question. Actually, the fact is that we haven't received many proposals. It's not, it's the, uh, the question would be why we are not receiving proposals. What happens in the countries? Like uh, you were explaining, uh, you are in the process of preparing an investment plan. So I think that there has been an, a positive evolution from the way we have been financing land use sector in the past from what we see now as a, as a next step of going beyond a one-off project and now looking into the an investment plan, and then a, a, a funding proposal to the GCF. And that takes time for, for countries. And already countries have invested a lot of time in preparing and getting ready for implementing Red Plus. And what happens is the translation to, to the financial part of those strategies. I think that that's why we are not receiving many proposals in some cases. There must, uh, probably there is also an, an administrative challenge in the countries in which in many cases the, our counterpart from the GCF is a certain ministry, while the ministries dealing with the Red Plus or land use are, are different ones in some countries. So the coordination among is, uh, different sectors, it might possibly be another challenge um, when, when we are respecting proposals. And another possible aspect is how countries are defining the implementation of, of the Red Plus strategies. Some countries are looking into the national scale as, a, as their am ambition, but in many countries that may have more challenges uh, how to, to go to that scale. So defining, as has been already mentioned before, uh, starting by, by jurisdiction or, or subnational scales like uh, Kalimantan, for example. How, how does Indonesia will scale up from there? How do you construct a national level implementation the first point is to, to define how, how would you start implementing your REPLA strategy. And that uh, is something that still I see countries that need to, to define when looking into investments. Uh, thank you, uh, Juan. Uh, other panelists may would like to respond? Is, if, is there any panelists, other panelists would like to respond? My question. Is there, this is not only access to the, the Green Climate Fund, but also uh, other sources of, of fund. Um, colleague, is there other, a question from the floor? Yeah, uh, please uh, state uh, your name and uh, also to whom the question uh, is directed, please. Sorry, uh, from New Forest, we're a forestry investment company based out of Australia, um, and we've been investing in Southeast Asian forests for um, since 2012. Earlier throughout the day, there were several calls from the government reps for more private sector interaction and involvement, and I was really struck, Martin, by your comments about some of the um, risks to early movers in Red Plus and sort of the penalties that they may face or just pure loss of capital. Um, wondered if the panel at large had any comments or suggestions for how the private sector can remain engaged as a stakeholder with the risk of sort of policy and regulatory fatigue um, while we wait for um, these jurisdictional approaches to really articulate how they will affect private sector actions and project level issues. How can we be most effective um, and not just along for the ride waiting another five or ten years? Okay, um, uh, please, uh, Mr. Martin, yep. Okay, um, so sorry, it's quite he hard to hear here because you sort of got like a, a football field echo at that way. Um, so I think you're asking how can the private sector um, manage its risk going forward? Is that in Okay, sure. Um, so I think, a a a as most people in this room would know, the private sector's engagement within RED early on was really through the VCS. So in the same way that the private sector took an early, I guess, um, an early risk that CDM would be materialised into a project-based mechanism they could trade, the same happened with, with RED. And part of the reason for that is because if you're an investor, you, um, you very much will have capital to invest on, an, on a specific project. And you invest that, you run that, the asset you create is carbon, 
the VCS came up. Many governments endorsed those projects and many of the existing VCS projects, we must remember this, are actually government endorsed. Peru, Kenya, other countries have, have strongly backed those projects. And so your revenue stream has been red. Governments to now turn around and say, well, we're not going to allow those projects to sell carbon post-2020 suddenly means that if you've been spending five years getting a red project up and running and you've been selling carbon and to finance that project, um, you've been doing that through the sale of credits for the last five years, you've suddenly got no revenue stream to fund that project. Now, let's remember some of these project activities, whether you like projects or not, are large-scale forest conservation projects which employ a lot of Indigenous people to do park ranges or, for example, if you take the Wildlife Works project that was funded by the IFC Bond, that's a project in Africa, in Kenya, that employs many people in, in textiles, ranges, etc. And so there's a whole community financed through that carbon sale. To cut that off basically means that project will die and then that will be the end of the project and the forest will, will be lost. So as a private sector, the challenge is much of the private sector is now focused on Corsia and hoping that in the red space, if they have credits, they'll be able to sell it through Corsia. Corsia is a long way away and there's a lot of political um, divide between those who believe red should only be jurisdictional based in Corsia and those who believe it should only be be based in, um, in, in, in pr who believe project offsets should be included. And that will continue to be a debate. And by the time it's resolved, for many projects, the, the timing's too long. So there's a real risk. So as a project, uh, as someone who's investing in red today, your choices really are to one, search out of, uh, well, if you're on the development side, you really have to work with host country governments to say, we want to put money into forests in your country. How can you help us to, to protect that investment to make sure that if you're doing a jurisdictional approach, that investment can be taken into that approach? How is our current investment going to be grandfathered? How will you provide us or enable us to do an Article 6 transfer so, and then leave us out of your NDC accounting or, or, or account for it in your NDC? So if you have a government like Australia this morning that says in the future we're interested in buying carbon and a government like Indonesia that's interested in selling it, as, a, as someone who can provide that carbon, how do you get that government endorsement to do that transaction as a pilot transaction? Or if you want to um, work with a GCF through a results-based payment, how does your activity contribute to the overall national activity that, that the GCF will buy those results? But how do you individually get protected and, and, and get some sort of guarantee that your investment will not be at risk? Um, if you're on the other side of the equation, um, it's, in, it's quite interesting because... There are certain countries that have articulated that they will accept transfers of red credits under Article 6. We do not know how that's going to play out, but in the Australian case, obviously, that gets devolved to industry that has an obligation to meet an emission reduction target, and the government says, we want to allow you to buy international offsets. So they will be wanting some guarantee from their government that if they buy international offsets from red, as many of them have, have done, that they'll be able to use them for domestic compliance going forward. And so on, on that side of the equation, um, I think, you know, if I was an, Aust an Australian business, after hearing my minister this morning, I'd be, I'd be saying, oh, that's fantastic that Australia's thinking about that. If we buy carbon, uh, red-based carbon from another country to meet our domestic commitment, will you guarantee that we will meet our obligation? That means Australia then takes on the risk of, of that carbon not being endorsed in the future under Article 6 if we buy it, were to buy it now. So, yeah, it's a very risky proposition. Um, it's a very challenging time for, for, for red projects um, because of this. We're in a state of flux between, so come 2020 when the Paris Agreement kicks in, that's when the, the rules change. Between now and then, it's sort of, we really are in a runoff period and we do not really know how this is all going to play out. And I think um, the discussion that De Deanne and I were having earlier was that, um, this morning, was that we don't really know how a lot of this is going to play out. And many countries who are developing their NDCs haven't really taken into account the fact that they've got existing commitments under the FCPF. So I can tell you one country which we've looked at, which is looking at an NDC commitment, it sold all of its carbon to the FCPF, it's got five red projects where it's sold carbon out of the country, um, it's also done some work with the UN read at the outset, and so it has a myriad of obligations which come 2020, they haven't quite worked out. So you as a private sector investor are really just on the side of all that, watching how it will unfold. So you need to engage with government and educate government about what some of the challenges that are being faced here and get them to endorse the sort of investment that you're making as part of an overall national approach to conserving the forests of the country. Uh, 
Thank you, uh, Mr. Martin. One more question, if uh, any? Yes, hello, thank you. My name is Florian Reimer from uh, Poop Projet. We are a, a social enterprise for the private sector to finance forest restoration, conservation, and agroforestry. Uh, planted uh, more than 8 million trees in the last 10 years purely by private sector finance. My question is a little bit similar to, I think, to the lady Kate from New Forest, um, and I think it goes to Ms. Dana Miniatis or Jack Hurd or Zhuang Shang or anybody who feels uh, up to it. Uh, this is not my first conference on uh, tropical forest conservation. I'm sure it's not yours either. And so how can we avoid actually trying to be in the same bubble and social comfort zone all the time of national governments, multilateral organizations, and research and NGOs without having the private sector actually being here? Uh, we hear so often that nine $500 billion dollars are needed from the private sector to fight climate change, and the private sector is hardly here. We know the deforestation in Indonesia comes from palm oil, cocoa, coffee, rubber, and those are all export commodities and many others, and those all go to international supply chains and the private sector, and the private sector is not here, really. So how could we remedy this maybe the next time for our next agenda and participants of such events? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, please, uh, the panelists who I think Mr. Martin again, and yeah, please, and Jack, yeah. Sorry, it's really hard to hear back here. Um, thank you for for that question. It's actually interesting because I wanted to to ask people in the room to stand per um, per identity. Um, and check how much private sector there was in the room or how many representatives from indigenous peoples or NGOs. Um, and because it's such a big room, I thought better not to do it, especially in the afternoon when the energy is a little bit low. But it, it, that question is spot on. How do we have those conversations? And they're hard sometimes to have in, um, in a big setting like this, but I think um, we've seen more and more in these conversations that we often do have private sector also today um, as panelists and, and in a room when we're having these discussions. One of the things that we have been working on um, as UNDP is leveraging private sector interests through the commodity sector. So often they are very vulnerable to climate change and they may not know how to engage in Red Plus, but actually Red Plus is not so interesting for them in itself. They may be facing pressures outside from uh, NGOs because they're causing deforestation or they may have um, issues of um, child labor in their commodity chains. And we may have donors that are, have um, private sector that are heavily involved in this and donors that are also looking at Red Plus. So a model we're testing out right now uh, with one bilateral donor um, is how to engage the private sector of that country when we're looking at Red Plus. And those are, that's basically developing business cases uh, specific to the country, specific to, an, uh, for example, in this case, a commodity, uh, be that rubber, be that palm oil, be that cocoa, and so forth, and using the leverage of the donor, so bilateral donor, to leverage their private sector to be interested in this discussion and bringing them all together in a, on a country level from their HQs, which may not, are usually not in the Red Plus countries we're working with, um, and bringing their country offices on board and having these discussions. So that's definitely a way uh, in which we're trying to have private sector more active in these discussions and also attract their interest because it has to be, yes, a financial interest. Sometimes um, the carbon story is a difficult one to tell and to get people interested in. So when you're actually looking at their core business, be that a commodity, for example, and they are worried about the sustainability of that commodity, cocoa is a very interesting example and, and an easy one. This is how we engage them in the bus business, when they're looking at the sustainability um, of their commodity chain. And that's how we invite them then, I think, in these forums 
uh, when they have a space to, to share their experiences and what they think they can contribute. And just understanding that also from our uh, perspective is not always so easy. Yeah, those are great comments. Um, I would just add two things. I think often what we see is certain fora tend to attract the public sector, certain fora tend to attract the private sector, and they don't always overlap entirely. So, for example, if you go to a general assembly meeting for the Forest Stewardship Council or for the Roundtable on Sustainable Palm Oil or for the Tropical Forest Alliance 2020, it'll be jam-packed with private sector people, but less so with the public sector people. And in fact, I remember in Jakarta, the first meeting of the Tropical Forest Alliance 2020 was there was basically zero government representatives there. So the, the, in, the, in that instance, we were thinking the private sector was going to solve all the problems around, uh, around deforestation and forest degradation in the pantropical belt. And so I, I think the issue here is that fora like these are wonderful for getting discussion going. And a lot of the issues surrounding deforestation and forest degradation, from my perspective, are really about governance and what is the long-term economic development strategy of a sovereign nation. That sovereign nation has to develop that strategy in, in, in cooperation with the private sector, no doubt. Um, but I think once you get out of these type of four, the more sectoral discussions do have an opportunity to play out, whether it's working with uh, industry associations in forestry or in rubber or some other agricultural commodity. I think it's at that level where you start to get a lot more constructive engagement between the different sectors and where the real problems get solved. Thanks. So just two very quick comments. Firstly, come to the private sector finance discussion tomorrow morning in this room because there'll be a lot of private sector people talking about finance. Um, the, the second answer is it's hard. So the fact is every major f um, private sector financier that's focused on financing forests through trying to get carbon has generally ended up relying on philanthropy or has ended up moving that capital into sustainable agriculture to really finance that as a means of trying to uh, prevent the drivers of deforestation. So you might have started off as a red fund to finance red, but you found out that, that we start off you know, trading carbon, that becomes quite difficult. So that capital quickly moves into, into the sustainable commodities, which are absolutely critical and important to prevent drivers of deforestation. But it is a different investment thesis, which is why the focus on sort of investing in a rainforest is different to investing in a sustainable supply chain or investing in sustainable coffee, for example. But do come to tomorrow's finance session. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, I think the we have more panelists would like to respond first uh gwen and then uh gwen gwen first and then Juan. Okay. oh okay yeah, yeah. no that, Juan, that was a very interesting question i think everybody wants to discuss about it well first of all by defining who is private sector and i guess all of us who are not in a public institution are private sector i'm sure there are many private sector actors here probably not in the panel and second is that um what what makes attractive for a private sector to be engaged as um, Don Colone would say, business is business. Or Jerry Maguire, show me the money. So what do we offer to the private sector to be part of this discussion? What, what is their motivation for them to, to be here or, or participate? What is the business case on deforestation? Huh? How do we address deforestation? And at the same time, we invite them to participate. And these are the things that need to be very concrete. Private sector is... is, is business oriented. There is a, a business case to, to, uh, to show them in order to attract them. So there is one part that has been discussed on the enabling condition. There is a huge role of the governments to provide those conditions. But then what's next? No? And from the ECF side, and there's a session tomorrow on that, we see that there is uh, huge opportunities now that are coming on how with these public sources of funding we can eventually provide the risking instruments to attract private sector. How to, can we in the face of the future potential markets that are coming, what else can we offer? So once we have those things concrete, I pretty believe that there will be more private sector engagement in these discussions. Thank you, Juan. Uh, Gwen, please. Thank you. Um, private sector participation in PNG has had um, different um, experiences, I guess. In the beginning, the private sector was the first to come in 
and do carbon projects. And that has had some benefits for the private sector, but not so much for the landowners and the people in the communities. Since we developed the National Red Pass strategy, uh, we've positioned red as an outcome of the sector's improvement or sustainability practices earned by uh, people in the industry or even in the communities by doing sustainable forest management in the forestry sector or improving agricultural practices. Since then, there's been a number of um, improvements, I would say, in the participation of the private sector. For instance, in the palm oil sector in PNG, the company that um, is operating there is RSPO certified. And they have come to the table because they need to continue that RSPO certification to be able to reach their market. So they are actually driving uh, sustainable palm oil um, in development in the country. We've recently worked with them. We're going to set up a palm oil platform which gives private sector a voice on how policies are developed uh, with that particular sector. In the forestry sector and other in the agriculture, in developing the GCF uh, proposal, GCF has this requirement of a, uh, what do you call it, counterpart funding, co-financing. Um, and so what we've had to do is really look at what the private sector is doing and bring them on board so they can be part of the uh, proposal development. Uh, and so they tell us exactly where they are spending their money on. If it's related to sustainability, then they will be the ones who implement our GCF or at least use the uh, co-financing from GCF to improve their practices. So there's some improvement in how private sector is uh, and, and awareness on how they want to participate in government policy as well as in trying to achieve uh, our Red Plus outcomes. Uh, thank you, uh, Gwen. Uh, colleague, um, time has never been enough to discuss the complex uh, issues uh, like uh, Red Plus, especially when uh, come to the uh, financial aspect. Um, I just uh, would like uh, to uh, take from this discussion the key messages uh, from uh, Red Plus uh, countries. Yeah. Um, uh, both uh, Indonesia and PNG, we have uh, Red Plus architecture uh, in place already. And uh, for uh, Indonesia, we always have, uh, we sometimes have a joke. Indonesia is in the phase three already, a full implementation without payment, like that. That's the joke. Uh, but this the reality. And um, the, we have common challenge uh, related to MRV. I think institutional uh, aspect also. It was uh, also mentioned by uh, some panelists when we talk about accessing uh, fund. And uh, the, the not promise of a national uh, government, I think something to learn from East Kalimantan. The historical uh, forest conversion caused by estate crops development and also mining uh, activities has uh, transformed East Kalimantan uh, towards um, sustainable uh, green growth uh, uh, concept. And um, we uh, should work together, um, East Kalimantan and the national government to uh, tackle the challenge uh, to move to the direction. And uh, on the finance and investment, it was in, uh, interesting uh, mentioned that um, private sector is business oriented. Now I think the discussion is there is possibility, there is huge potential to bring private sector in our endeavor in forestry sector. But the challenge remains the same. There is many things required to be done in, in our forest countries. There are some things to be solved at the international level too. So uh, tomorrow there will be a sub-team uh, that uh, discuss further on uh, finance and investment. I think the concrete discussion should be brought to that uh, sub-team uh, uh, session. And then uh, I think we, we are pleased to um, hear the development in 
uh, GCF, uh, at least there, there are uh, already some allocation for piloting, piloting uh, Red Plus. Now, uh, we are Red Plus countries in the Asia Pacific, uh, how we share uh, our experience and also our partner, how the partner uh, could facilitate us uh, so that we could have uh, capacity to access uh, that fund if this is related to the capacity. Um, yeah, re regarding uh, indigenous people, I think Buddha near the long journey, but we have started already the long journey with positive uh, signs. So let's be optimistic. Uh, so um, before closing, I would like uh, to thank all uh, panelists for the uh, very uh, informative and also insightful um, views there that uh, shared in this, in this session. Uh, thank you also to my team, uh, Bu uh, Novia, uh, and team who has uh, communicated directly to all panelists uh, so that we, we could uh, successfully got all panelists that we wanted. So thank you. Thank you to the panelists. Thank you to uh, my team, Ubu Novi and others. And uh, also, uh, thanks to all participants for being patient uh, to be here till we close the, the session. So let's close uh, the session. Thank you. Uh, a good uh, late afternoon. And uh, selamat sore menjelang malam. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. because the organizing committee uh, have uh, souvenirs uh, to give to all panelists. Um, yeah, Bunefi, yeah. And last not last but not least, uh, we would like also like to uh, present this uh, souvenir to Ibu Nur, our moderator. So this is from uh, the organizers. On behalf of the organizer, I would like to give this to Ibu Nur. So thank you very much, Ibu Nur, and thank you very much, all panelists, for the nice uh, discussion. So we will have a picture here, and please open the souvenir so we can uh, show this to the audience.